Hello, everyone. My name is Elena G. Levine. I'm president of Quantum Success Solutions and author of the book Networking for Nerds. I'm a professional speaker and I'm a STEM career consultant. Working with nerds is both my passion and my profession. So I'm so excited, like 11 level excited to be here with you today with this amazing star star uh, panel of stars from the world of psychology to talk with you about how you can plan your path to your postdoc. We're going to be talking about how to get your postdoc, how to enjoy your postdoc and really get the most out of the postdoc experience, and how you can leverage your postdoc for the future, for building a unicorn career, a joyous career that meets your specifications. So before I introduce the panel, I want to thank again the Association for Psychological Science for their kind support of this webinar and remind you that this webinar is being recorded. You will be able to access it in the near future on the APS website, and I'm going to give you that uh, that um, uh, link right now. And as you probably know, we've been doing a lot of these webinars and panels this past season. You can access all of the recordings on the website, psychologicalscience.org slash webinars. So I hope you will join us for those. I am really excited that APS just recently announced that their annual conference their virtual conference is going to be indeed virtual. So this is the first time that APS is going to be initiating a virtual convention. This will take place May 26th through the 27th of 2021. I hope that you will be there. They're going to be presenting an all-star agenda scientific program of um, speeches and workshops. There'll be career events, there'll be exhibitors, there'll be lots and lots of networking opportunities. And I hope you will take advantage of this, especially those of us who are located in very um, distant places, not only on the round earth, but in the galaxy and perhaps across the universe. This is your chance to attend an APS conference without the travel, without the burden of the cost, it is going to be a phenomenal networking opportunity, and the organization is going to really make available to you opportunities to develop and facilitate very enriching networking chances with people. So I hope you will attend that. I think it's going to be really great. Now, we're talking about postdocs. We're talking about careers, and guess what? The APS Employment Network is a freaking fantastic that is the scientific way of saying it, by the way. I think you'd agree. A freaking fantastic resource. OMG, you guys, seriously? The APS Employment Network has lots and lots of different resources for you, job listings. You can find postdocs there, fellowships, all sorts of different opportunities, again, to help you advance your career and also explore different career paths that you want to take. So I hope that you will go to jobs.psychologicalscience.org so that you can take advantage of this amazing resource that APS is providing your community. And I wanted to also remind you today that we, we will be taking questions from you. And you can add your question at any time throughout the session in the question panel of the webinar console. And if you have any technical difficulties, you can put a note in there too, and one of our team members will try to help you as well. All right, let's go forward. Let me introduce our all-star panel, our amazing group of STEM goddesses in psychological science today. I am so excited to welcome Joy Gang. She's a PhD uh, professor uh, in the Department of Psychological, excuse me, Psychology and in the Center of Mind and Brain at UC Davis. Welcome, Joy. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to welcome Amy Rapp, also a PhD. She's doing her postdoc. She's a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for OCD Related Disorders at Columbia University and the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Welcome, Amy. Glad you could join us. And I'd also like to welcome Catherine Storrs, a PhD. She's a postdoc researcher uh, in the Department of Experimental Psychology in Eustis Liebig University. So welcome, Kate. So glad you could join us too. So while we get started, Let's start with Joy. Uh, ladies, could you tell us a little bit about your career journey, what you studied, where you are in your career right now, and how you got your postdoc? And, and Joy, I know that you, as a professor, you hire postdocs. So I'd like to hear your perspective, both as a former postdoc yourself and as somebody who hires postdocs. Joy, why don't we start with you, please? OK, thanks. Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, so I was a psychology undergraduate um, and I did my PhD at Carnegie Mellon University. So in, when it was time to look for a postdoc, I sort of did a combination of things. Um, I looked at job advertisements and also emailed individuals that I thought would be interesting to work with or 
actually my PhD supervisor, Marlene Berman, did that on my behalf. Um, so I was quite shy about that. And, um, and uh, she, she graciously sort of took care of a lot of that emailing for me. Um, so of those that I emailed, you know, some had positions and some did not. Um, one that uh, did have a job advertisement open was um, somebody who had an advertisement was John Driver at the University of College London in the UK. Um, I applied for that job, went for an interview, um, but it turned out that I wasn't a necessarily a good fit for the advertised job. So I think they're looking for more of a neuropsychologist. Um, but he did offer to sort of write grants with me in order to um, fund a postdoc. And so we wrote two grants. Um, one was at NRSA through NIH and one was a Royal Society postdoctoral fellowship um, through the UK. So the latter was funded and I went on that mechanism. But as an aside, the NRSA was not funded. And um, since then I've served on an NRSA panel. And I think that one of the comments that um, really stuck with me uh, from the reviewers was that there wasn't a clear enough training plan for what I was going to do. So they said that it wasn't clear how my postdoc years would be different from my PhD years. So of course I was planning to do really different things, it was a totally different environment, everything was going to be new, but I think we didn't articulate clearly enough to the panel um, how the training, what the training goals were, um, how the training plan would help um, advance my career, and those are the things that sort of um, uh, well, those are things that contributed to the um, failure of that, that grant. Um, so since then, I've learned a lot about the importance of the training plan, not just the research plan and the NRSA applications. And um, I think for people looking to transition to their postdoc years, that's something really important to think about um, if you're going to go for one of those mechanisms. Um, so in terms of postdocs that I'm hiring now, I, I look for one of two things. So one, it might be um, a method that the, the student, the, uh, the person as a student has um, uh, has that I can bring to my lab. Um, and this person doesn't necessarily have to have worked in the topic that I'm currently working in, um, but they have to have an, obviously an interest in doing that. Um, the other kind of person might be somebody who has a lot of passion for the topic that uh, we're already working in, um, but doesn't have as maybe um, as strong of a skill set um, as another student might, but both individuals would bring something really substantial to the lab. Um, in our lab, we also like to make sure that there's a good personality fit. Um, so we're looking for somebody who's collaborative, somebody that is willing to work with a number of different kinds of people and be sort of open to uh, that kind of interaction. Um, so I think those are just, the, those would be the three things that I would look for in a postdoc. Thanks, Joy, and I appreciate your candor. I mean, I think it's important for all of us to understand that not every action we take in science and in our career is gonna work out exactly how we envision it at first, but if we learn from it, it can actually lead to something better in the future. So I appreciate you sharing that. Amy, tell us a little bit about your journey and what you're doing right now in your postdoc and how you got your postdoc, please. Yeah, absolutely, um, thank you so much for having me. So um, again, I'm currently in my postdoctoral position. I'm in the Center for OCD and Related Disorders um, in the uh, Department of Psychiatry at Columbia. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at Middlebury College, a small liberal arts school in Vermont. Um, I spent two years as a research assistant in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, also at Columbia. Um, and then following that, I pursued my PhD in clinical psychology at UCLA. Um, so I would say that my path to finding my postdoc really started with um, thinking about my application for my pre-doctoral clinical internship. So um, again, coming from a clinical psychology PhD, um, you know, that was a, a part of my training. So um, for those who aren't in clinical psychology or aren't aware, um, the pre-doctoral internship is um, a year of intensive training where you're getting uh, basically accumulating hours in assessment and intervention to um, prepare you to be eligible for licensure. Um, and the process for finding that uh, placement is kind of similar to a medical residency in that um, you can apply to sites outside of your institution and then you are matched to a single institution that you eventually go to. So um, I had really two priorities that guided my search. First, um, with kind of an eye towards postdoc and towards my career, 
Um, I wanted to um, be in a place that was very research oriented. Um, you know, I, I really focused on academic research centers. And then also I had a, um, a geographic preference. I'm from New York originally, and I wanted to um, eventually find my way back to the East Coast um, and to New York. So my list of internship sites um, focused a lot. They were all, um, you know, large research institutions or medical centers predominantly on the East Coast with kind of a sub-focus in New York. Um, and I found out in about March of 2018 that I had matched at UCLA in the medical center in the general child track. So, you know, I think what I'd say about that is just there are, I've kind of, when I was going through that process, received a lot of different type of um, advice about sort of transitioning from internship to postdoc. Um, some people said, you know, you're gonna just stay on wherever you match for internship. Other people told me it didn't really matter. And in my experience, both were true. I would say of my internship cohort at UCLA, about half stayed on and did postdocs at UCLA um, coming from other institutions. But then there were people like me who found positions outside of UCLA. So, I mean, ultimately it was um, great. I'm, I'm, you know, in addition to really excellent clinical training, it also was helpful for finishing up my dissertation. So that was a concern as well, um, thinking ahead to postdoc. Um, my dissertation was supported by an NIMH F31 grant, um, a pre-doctoral NRSA. And so it was helpful to be able to continue with data collections. I would do that on the weekends and also have access to my mentorship team. Um, so I could easily set up meetings and talk about data analysis and writing of my um, dissertation and things like that um, pretty easily. So um, around the time um, that I found out about uh, matching for internship, I followed up with um, my the, the PI I worked for when I was a research assistant at Columbia. She had since moved on to a different institution, but still was very familiar with the postdoctoral positions that were available at Columbia and other kind of affiliated hospitals in the area. So we talked about a number of different options. Um, she's someone who I kind of had always stayed in touch with and was um, continued to provide mentorship. And so um, she and I talked about a NIMH T32 fellowship that was available through the Child and Adolescent Division. So, um, Going into my inter the summer before going into my internship, I was home visiting my family and I set up a few in person meetings with faculty members who seemed um, who were had open positions on the fellowship and whose resource interests were aligned with my own and I spoke with them and sort of preliminarily got the ball rolling on applying for that postdoctoral position. Um, I put postdoc aside for a couple of months while I kind of got acclimated to my clinical internship. And then in September um, of 2018, kind of picked up my search again. And I did a couple of different things at that point. Um, so I, um, I kind of kept an eye on all of the different professional listservs that I was on. So in addition to APS, which is a wonderful professional organization and there's so many networking opportunities. Um, I'm also a member of some more clinically organi um, oriented organizations like ABCT, ADAA, um, and also divisions 53 and 12 of um, the APA as well as SSCP. Um, so I'm on all the listers for those and was kind of keeping an eye out for any relevant positions that were being announced. Um, I did the cold email um, as well to a few faculty members who, um, whose research I really admired and who I was very interested in working with to see if they had open positions. Um, the other thing I did was do a more refined search for, and I, for T32 fellowships. And so um, the tool that helped me with that was um, I used uh, NIH Reporter, which is basically a database of every funded grant through the NIH. and so. Um, in this database, you can kind of do a wild card search for T32s, and I searched specifically for those that were funded by NIMH and NICHD. Um, and then the last thing I did, which is what actually led to me finding my postdoc, was regularly checking the APS employment network. So 
very genuine plug for this. It's a great resource. Um, there's a lot of excellent postings. And um, on in kind of mid-September, I saw a posting from my current mentor, Dr. Blair Simpson, um, advertising an open postdoc position that um, also, um, you know, that she would also be interested in supporting an application to um, a T32 fellowship in the adult psychiatry division. So this was a fellowship in um, anxiety and related disorders. Um, so over the course, uh, you know, I sent a, my CV, kind of a statement of interest um, to Dr. Simpson. And over the course of the month of October, we had a series of phone calls and kind of back and forth email exchanges. And through that process, I wrote um, uh, uh, some, uh, basically went through a process of honing in on a proposal that was unique to my research interests, to the skills I wanted to develop, but also that was, um, could be supported within the infrastructure of her existing lab. So we uh, worked on that throughout the course of October. Um, and then simultaneously, I also was speaking with faculty members um, who were up, um, on the T32 and the Child and Adolescent Division too. So I was kind of working on these applications in parallel. In November, um, I was home, I was on the East Coast for the ABCT convention, and then I also went to uh, New York to spend time with my family over Thanksgiving. And during that time, set up some in-person meetings with Dr. Simpson and her team, as well as members of the faculty on the Child Adolescent T32. Um, at that time, I also worked with Dr. Simpson to finalize my proposal. I sent it to the T32 uh, program director and also had a meeting with the program director at that point. Um, I submitted all my materials officially by the end of November. And then over the course of December, had a series of phone and in-person interviews for that T32. Um, and I also submitted my application for the child adolescent um, T32 in December. Um, simultaneously, I did apply for one other position. It was slightly more clinically oriented, but was in a hospital system um, that I was very interested in. And that what, you know, uh, basically consisted of some in-person and over the phone interviews over the month of December. So by January, I um, was, uh, you know, notified that I had been accepted to the adult T32 program. At that point, I withdrew my application from the Child Adolescent Psychiatry T32, um, and also a few days later found out that I hadn't received an offer for the clinical position, so that all kind of worked out. Um, but that was kind of my, uh, my timeline, and you know, I'm happy to talk more about um, kind of pursuing these different types of fellowship funding positions and what that application process looks like because it is relatively involved. Um, and has some kind of nuances and things like that. Thank you, Amy. And I'm so glad that you brought up this idea of um, doing multiple tasks at once, not just investing in one idea or one fellowship or one postdoc, but actually uh, creating a suite of options for yourself by pursuing multiple opportunities. Great point. So glad you brought that up. Kate, can you tell us a little bit about your career journey, what you're doing now, how you got your postdoc, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm currently a postdoc in Germany. Uh, I study visual perception in humans. Uh, currently, I'm studying how we perceive mid-level visual properties like shapes and materials. Uh, I use behavioral experiments, and I also use a lot of computational modeling, uh, particularly things like deep neural network modeling. Uh, this is my second postdoc, and I've worked using quite different research methods in my two postdocs than I did in my PhD. Uh, and I've also done uh, an industry role and a teaching role along the way. So I've had quite a meandering um, path, kind of uh, motivated by following fun opportunities when they arose, uh, which I think has generally worked out fine. Um, so I'll spend a few minutes outlining that path. Um, I want to first kind of acknowledge that things are really strange and challenging at the moment when I think back to the specific strategies I used, things like going to loads of conferences and some schools and lab visits and being able to move between countries on, you know, a few months at a time. Uh, none of that stuff is possible right now, I know. Um, I think there are virtual equivalents and that's probably something that we can talk about um, 
sort of during the discussion phase, um, but I want to uh, sort of flag that the particular path I have is not something that you could do right now in 2020. <laughs> um, and I did my um, undergraduate in psychology in Australia, I'm Australian. Uh, then I did my PhD in Australia, uh, starting in 2011 in a lab that I was already familiar with from undergrad research work. It was a psychophysics lab. Uh, we used behavioral experiments to study very low level visual perceptions of like orientation and contrast, uh, which I really enjoyed. Uh, but I also wanted to do what I felt like were the bigger questions in vision, things like object recognition. Uh, and I really loved the computational modeling side of the field, which my supervisor wasn't really interested in. Um, so I knew that generally I wanted to do a postdoc because I was committed to the idea of a career as an academic scientist. Um, and specifically, I knew that I wanted to find a postdoc that would let me learn computational skills uh, and let me move into kind of higher level object recognition kind of research questions. Uh, my first kind of meandering curveball um, came a couple of years into my PhD uh, when I heard about a nine-month lecturing job at UCL, the same institute in London that Joy mentioned. Uh, there was a professor who was going on sabbatical and needed someone to cover his lectures for a couple of semesters. And this was this professor was friends with my PhD supervisor, and he was someone I'd met at conferences. And he actually suggested that I apply for the job, uh, which seemed kind of crazy given that I was like two years into my PhD thesis. Um, but it also seemed very exciting because London is a super exciting place for neuroscience. Uh, so I interviewed for it and got it and moved to London on like three weeks notice in the middle of my PhD. And then for the next nine months, I was writing and delivering lectures pretty much full time, which was terrifying while trying to finish off my PhD in like the evenings. Um, it was very kind of stressful and unstable, um, but it was also very interesting because London is a really interesting place to be. So many like talks and workshops and conferences and people to meet. Uh, which kind of indirectly led to my first postdoc, because um, at one of these workshops, I met a guest professor who was currently visiting a lab in Cambridge, which I'd had my eye on for years. Um, they did exactly the kind of like computationally heavy object recognition work that I really wanted to do. Um, so I was talking to uh, this guest professor, um, and he suggested that I emailed the head of the lab in Cambridge, uh, which I did, and I just told him that I'd been talking to this other professor about potential links between my research and theirs and that I was coming to the end of my PhD. This was about three years in by this point. Uh, and could I maybe come up to Cambridge and just have a chat about collaborations or postdoc projects? Uh, he ignored my email, but then he sent another one and he answered that one. Uh, so I went up and we had like a half hour meeting. Um, we had lots of fun project ideas. We sort of had a lot of the same research interests. Uh, and he agreed that he'd potentially be up for me joining the lab, but he said that I should try to apply for my own fellowship funding. Um, as Joy says, this is a very um, sort of common way of getting into research um, sort of labs is they're way more happy to have you if you can bring your own money into the lab. Uh, so I wrote two fellowship applications to work with him, um, one from a, a UK um, funding body, one from an international funding body. Uh, in the meantime, my my month teaching contract uh, had come to an end and I'd moved back to Australia. Uh, both of my fellowship applications ended up being rejected, which is not unusual. The success rate for the schemes I applied for was between 15 and 20 percent, which is quite common for postdoc fellowships. Um, it's a blow, but you have to expect that uh, these things don't stand a very high chance of being accepted. Um, but I was still scheming for ways to get into the lab, so I applied for a small travel grant from my institute in Australia to go back and do a lab stay in this lab in Cambridge. Um, my, my reasoning was that if I could kind of get my foot physically into the door, maybe they would like relent and hire me, um, which they did after several more months of stress and uncertainty. Eventually, they advertised for a postdoc position um, and I interviewed for it and got it. Uh, so I did two years of uh, postdoc there, learned loads. I uh, was learning fMRI data analysis and deep neural network modeling, machine learning, which were things I had no experience of in my postdoc and my PhD. Uh, then there was the second uh, curveball when a friend told me that Twitter, the social media company in London, 
were looking for vision scientists, like human visual perception researchers, to design um, uh, human experiments to measure perceived video quality on the Twitter platform, uh, which seemed super exciting to me because I was just fascinated by kind of experiencing what it was like to uh, work in a big tech company. Uh, so I applied and interviewed for and got that, which was initially a three month paid internship. Uh, and then I stayed on for another three months as a data scientist. So I ended up taking six months of unpaid leave from my postdoc in order to go off to London and work for six months as a kind of data scientist at Twitter, uh, which was a fascinating experience and taught me lots about efficient project management, and all of these things. Um, then eventually I went back to my postdoc, but in the meantime, unfortunately, my supervisor had announced that he was moving to the US and that the lab was kind of dissolving. Um, so then I decided that rather than follow him to the US, I was going to do a second postdoc in a different lab because I'd learned a huge amount in those couple of years. They were super useful. I'd got the fundamentals of fMRI and deep learning, uh, but I found that I wasn't super keen on the fMRI part and we hadn't really published anything because I'd spent most of my time learning new skills. Uh, and I now um, it was becoming increasingly fascinated in kind of mid-level vision, feeling like that was where the really tractable problems were. Um, and I wanted to learn like 3D rendering to have better control over my stimuli. So I had to think about who was doing the kind of work that I wanted to do. Uh, and I ended up cold emailing a PI here in Germany, uh, whose work I'd also been following for years and uh, loved. And I just told him again that uh, I loved the work and I was looking for a postdoc and would he be interested in uh, sort of having me come give a talk, having us maybe apply for fellowships together, uh, which I did. I came over and gave a talk and very fortuitously, the lab had recently won a big lab grant and he was hiring postdocs anyway. So he hired me directly as a postdoc the second time around, um, which was way less painful, but it's also very slow. It was still uh, maybe six months from initial contact to actually being hired. Um, so even in the best case, these things take many months. And if you're applying for fellowships, they take, I don't know, I budget like a year for putting in and hearing the outcome and then, you know, going to the lab for a fellowship. Um, so that's almost it. And then once I came here, although I was employed under a postdoc contract, I decided anyway to apply for two more fellowships because uh, it always looks good on your CV, particularly if you're kind of looking for faculty positions at the end of it to have had experience winning your own funding. Um, and it's a lot less stressful if you have a job and you're not, you know, desperately relying on this. Um, one was rejected and one was awarded. So I have a one in four success rate so far, which is about what the base rate, slightly higher than the base rate of getting these things is. Um, so the system works, I guess. Um, and yeah, so I'm currently on that fellowship until the end of next year. And then hopefully that will be the end of my path through postdocs and I'll be looking for um, starting my own lab positions. Thank you, Kate. And I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of you bringing up the idea of timing, uh, not only being an important factor in how we plan our career and move towards a postdoc and leverage our postdoc, but also in understanding that that certain things will take time. And sometimes when we reach out to people like doing the cold emails, like we had discussed earlier, sometimes that is not the right time. But if we stay connected mm -hmm. with the professor, with the, with the scholar, there's always a chance that they will remember us, will think of us. And when they have an opportunity in their lab, in their research group, they'll come to us. So uh, having mm -hmm. that patience, that resilience, I think, and also that uh, persistence, it really does tend to pay off. We've been getting a lot of questions already. In fact, we've gotten a lot of them and several of the questions have been dealing with funding. So I'd like to ask you, is this, which comes first, the funding or the postdoc, or do they work in concert with each other? Should I be applying, if I'm a graduate student, should I be applying for fellowships now to get a postdoc? And then will I take that money and then approach a PI and ask her or him if I can work in their lab? How does it work with the funding? If whoever would like to answer, I'd love to know. So I can um, say at least, in, uh, at least in Europe, generally, the lab comes first. Um, there may be, I'm sure there are lots of differences between different schemes, but uh, for all of the ones that I know of, you have to apply for a specific department and a specific lab and a research project that makes sense within that lab. So 
you first need to approach a PI for the lab that you're interested in working in and then work with them to come up with a feasible idea that fits your interests and their interests and then you write that up as a, a, grant, a fellowship application. Yeah, I would agree with that um, here as well. If you're planning to write a grant, for example, like an NRSA, you have to have identified a lab to go into, and that person actually has to contribute a substantial amount of time and commitment to helping you to craft the application so that it's a good fit, um, because reviewers will pick up immediately if it's not a good fit and, and it will be rejected on those grounds. Um, I would say I think it's a lot easier if the money already exists in the lab. So you might actually want to look for postdocs that follow like the funding cycles um, in some sense, because when people have an award and you know, usually you're able to hire somebody immediately, um, but if you don't have somebody in the queue, then you send out an advertisement. And so um, those are much simpler in the sense that there's a job available, there's money available, and then you could just apply and slot yourself into that position. Um, Joy, but do you of mind course, clarifying? Oh, excuse me for interrupting. Do you mind clarifying what you mean by following the funding cycles? Yeah. So I mean, I think all all like you know, NIH grants follow a particular cycle in terms of when um, applications are due and then when funding announcements are kind of made. So people know at certain times of the year whether they're going to have money in the near future or not. Um, and they also know if they've put in an application so they can judge sort of the likelihood of getting um, a grant funded or not. And so if I've just put in a grant, I might begin to sort of think about who I might be able to hire. And if that funding comes through, I'll be ready to hire immediately. Um, and so the cycle is kind of, there's not just once a year, this ha happens like maybe three times a year. Um, and so it's worth, you know, checking in um, and checking back with people to see like what their um, funding, um, their grant application timeline looks like. And that could dictate when positions become avail available. So are you suggesting, let's say I am interested in area X and field X, and I've done, let's say, a literature search, or I've seen, for example, that a number of different professors who are experts in X have spoken for APS conferences in the past. So I, there are people who are at the forefront of my mind that I would like to work with as for my postdoc. Are you saying that I should contact them, let's say, in whenever the month is that, or the, the, the several months across the year, that the announcements are made about funding, like, hey, Dr. X, I just wanted to check in with you. I know that the NIH announcements are coming out. Uh, just came out last week and see if you have funding. Is that what you mean or do you mean something well, different? Well, I mean, I don't think it, it needs to be so explicit in some sense, but um, sort of to know that these cycles work multiple times a year. But I think, if the, you know, you can contact somebody as early as you know that you would like to work with them and they can also put your interest in their um, grant application cycles. So if I know somebody's interested in working with me and they have a specific timeline, I might work a little harder to get a grant in um, in, in, the, in the time that would allow them to come to my lab, um, or I might procrastinate and wait, you know, then for the next cycle if there's no urgency. Um, so, so I think just getting uh, in contact right away when you know and have as much time um, as you can as a buffer between when you contact somebody and when you have to leave your current lab is generally a, a good idea. We will come back to the, the issue of timing as to when I should start my process and apply and, and all those things. I want to come back to that in a moment. But Amy, did you have anything you wanted to share about the money question? Yeah, I mean, I think it also kind of depends, um, kind of uh, building off of a point that Joy already made about, you know, are you trying to pursue your own independent research project, in which case you might be submitting a postdoctoral NRSA? Um, and that's where you're really the PI and you're driving it and you have to meet the submission deadlines and um, kind of facilitate that whole process. Um, it, it's somewhat similar for, for a T32. You're not the PI of that grant. It's a training grant awarded to the institution that then appoints fellows, but it has kind of, um, you know, a similar independently motivated um, feeling to it. Um, or, you know, or, you know, the other thing is that um, faculty members will have their grants and they're just looking for people who want to, um, you know, like oversee those grants and be involved in the administration of those grants. So I think part of this funding question about how much do you need to be kind of bringing this to the table versus um, looking for faculty members that are well-funded kind of depends on what your goals are too in terms of are you trying to conduct your own research study that's very independently motivated or are you okay with kind of being plugged into an existing project? 
So it sounds like there's a couple of different, not even a couple, there's actually several different ways, maybe even more than that, that I could potentially get funding and get a postdoc. And a lot of it, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting the sense from, from the team here today that a lot of it is very collaborative in nature. In other words, I have to make myself known to these different professors to let them know, I, I see relevance in what you're working on as it relates to what I want to do. I, I'd like to learn more about how I could contribute to your, your team, contribute to your research group. Would you say that this type of networking where you reach out to professors that are on your radar, people who you are really excited about, uh, would be appropriate to start the conversations to that could lead to you getting an actual position and, as Joy said, also lead to the faculty member supporting your fellowship application. Is this common in this realm? Is this type of networking common in this realm for, for, for landing a postdoc? I found that to be the case um, for myself, and you know, I almost thought of my process of developing my um, application materials as like a three-month interview because um, you know I was kind of collaboratively working with my current mentor to to write these materials, um, and I think that's also what kind of solidified my decision to accept the position was that. I enjoyed that working process. It gave me a preview of what that relationship would look like. Um, and I think it was also, you know, something that um, I kind of developed as an initial impression of going through that application process and since has um, fared out to be very true is that my um, mentor was, you know, she also understood my career goals. And through that process of applying for something like a T32, where the goal is to bring on trainees who want to pursue an academic research career. You know, she demonstrated that she really understood that. She was going to do what she could to sort of facilitate that um, and also kind of connect me to people um, to help me build skills that were outside her realm of expertise. So I would say that process of getting to know your potential mentor, what that working relationship is going to be like, um, it, was very important for me. I think it's important for other people in other people's processes as well. And I think it's important to remember that we shouldn't feel we're not invading or intruding on the space or the time of a faculty member. If we email them and just ask for even a 15 minute uh, Skype or Zoom appointment, I want to learn more about what you're working on and see if there's a way that I can contribute to your lab. Kate, what are your thoughts? I would say that, uh, I mean, absolutely that process of networking is sort of essential um, for getting jobs, but it's also a, just a core part of doing science from PhD onwards, getting to know the senior and junior people in your field who are doing research that you like and is relevant to you is, is what science is. It's a fundamentally collaborative process and it has all sorts of pragmatic benefits. Um, a major one is that then when you're on the job market, you have a network of people who know your work and are immediately interested in the idea of you working for them. Um, but also, um, you know what current projects other labs are working on that they might not have published yet. If you know that if you've had conversations with them, uh, they know of your work and are more likely to cite it. Um, if you're hosting a workshop, they're more likely to come and give a talk. If, you, if they're hosting a workshop, they're more likely to think of you and invite you. Um, all of the, the aspects of citation and conversation and collaboration and job finding uh, rely on talking to the people who are doing cool stuff that's like your stuff. Absolutely. And we gave a webinar on networking, particularly during the pandemic earlier this year, which is on the APS website, same area as uh, psychologicalscience.org slash webinar. So you can take a look at that recording. I want to ask the team here about it since we're talking about timing. Could you be specific and tell me, I'm a graduate student, when should I actually start the formal process of applying for the fellowships, reaching out to professors to explore potential postdoc appointments, and applying for postdocs? Should I be doing this a year before my graduation? You mentioned three months, Amy. What What's the timeline like? I think I started looking about a year before I was planning to graduate. Um, and so you're a little, you have a little bit of latitude with that kind of timeline. So if things don't 
you know, you can kind of take it slowly for the first couple of months and just sort of reach out to individuals that you're interested in. Um, it takes quite a long time to put together a grant with somebody, especially if you don't know them. Um, and you have to juggle your, you know, finishing your dissertation potentially with the grant writing. And, um, and so I think that can take, that can take time. So add about a year. Good point. Yeah, I budget a year. It's always taken me about a year to get from thinking that I'm going to need a job in the future to <laughs> nailing one down. I, I was the same. So I kind of had my first meeting about pursuing a postdoc in um, June of 2018, and I graduated in June of 2019. Okay, good. So in other words, don't do the day before. <laughs> yeah. I might add that I also did a second postdoc. It was it was a relatively short one, but um, I was constrained by a lot of different other personal factors at that time. So I had a kid in my, during my first postdoc, um, which may or may not have been a good idea. I'm not sure, but uh, he's 14, so it seems fine. Um, and uh, and so I think there that took a look, that also took about a year in advance of thinking of where I could go, where I needed to go, where I wanted to go, how I can make my personal life and my professional life work together. Um, and so if you're constrained by other factors, you might also want to consider that that might require a little bit more time to find a good fit. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to do so, but, um, but it took time. Thank you. So we got a great question from Sumana, and thank you, Sumana, for asking this question about publishing, publications and publishing. And I hear this a lot from the postdocs that I interact with. How much should I, if I'm applying for a postdoc or a fellowship or both, um, how many publications should I have? How many publications would I have? I mean, if I don't, if I haven't published much in my graduate school years, is that going to be uh, to detriment to myself? To, tell me a little bit about the role that your publications play in actually getting a postdoc. And Joy, from your perspective as somebody who hires postdocs, uh, what you look for in terms of the publishing publishing record of the potential candidates? Um, okay, uh, maybe I'll just go cut the line and go first really quickly. Um, so I think that it, it varies a lot. So I think obviously having publications helps, especially for grant applications. So that will be something that people look at to see how productive you've been in the past. Um, I think it matters potentially a little bit less if somebody's looking for an individual and you fit that bill well in other ways. So for example, even if you don't have a lot of publications, but you have demonstrated skills, um, that could be something that that somebody is really um, looking for and is very desirable for a lab. Um, I think that you know publications kind of happen when they do, and it's not something that we can guarantee for ourselves or anybody else at a particular time. So I think you know it's important to think about publications from the very beginning, and hopefully the PI in your lab will help you sort of um, navigate that that uh, necessity. Um, but because it's not something we can fully control, I think just focusing on doing good science and doing what you love and learning in skills is more important than focusing on how many publications exactly you have. Um, because nobody can ever take away your skills, nobody can take away your knowledge, and that will be something that you can demonstrate in your writing, in your interviews, et cetera. Um, so, uh, yeah. Go ahead, please. That's all I have to say. Oh, I was just going to say, and and so the the point that you're making, and I really appreciate that you said this, Joy, about the skills, is that am I correct in saying that it's not just that when you're evaluating a candidate for a postdoc position, it's not just the publications that is going to convince you that this person is the right person. Uh, it's the evidence that they are a scientist. It's an evidence that they understand how to develop. Uh, and pursue scientific goals and develop experiments. And have yeah, experiments. And I think I think that's particularly true because even if you have a publication, right, um, other people contribute to that publication oftentimes as well. And so it's not always clear just from the publication uh, list exactly what it is that um, are the strengths and the weaknesses of an individual. And so anybody who will hire you or any grant sort of agency will look at your background and um, try to evaluate exactly what it is that you can do and what it is that you know. Um, so, um, of course, publications are important. I think we all know that, but um, there are other other factors that I think are important. Kate, Amy, did you want to share anything about this particular topic? 
I feel like I was very fortunate that my PhD supervisor uh, really encouraged us to start publishing ASAP and that working in behavioral vision experiments, it's a very fast moving kind of field. You can design and run an experiment and then write it up in like six months, which is not true if you're running fMRI or electrophysiology or lots of other things. Um, so when I finished, when I was applying for my first postdoc, I had four first author and four middle author papers. And when I was applying for my second, I had six first author and six middle author. I don't think that my, um, I don't think that the people who hired me ever actually read any of my papers. I think they sort of <laughs> skimmed the titles. Um, but the, the thing that I think was invaluable was that uh, they had seen me at conferences multiple times, like another thing that my PhD supervisor was great at was encouraging us and paying for us to go to uh, international and domestic conferences multiple times a year. So um, the people who uh, were hiring me had, even if they hadn't met me in person, they'd kind of had me on the radar from having seen uh, conference talks. And so having worked through lots of projects and published them during my PhD meant that I'd been given lots of conference talks and had the opportunity to completely work through the scientific cycle from designing to running to analyzing and writing up and presenting multiple times, um, which I think the people who hired me knew and valued that. Uh, certainly for applying for grants, um, I, I think, as Joy says, it's much more important to have a reasonably large number or at least reasonably high impact factor uh, publications um, because you don't get to talk to the funding agency in person and persuade them of your skills and your fit to the lab um, but yeah i mean it's certainly good yeah i i don't think there's um you know kind of a magic number of publications or anything like that um, and I, I do think it really relates to, you know, what was your role in, in that publication and more so than number of publications and also um, kind of what skills you're able to convey from these publications. So for me, I don't have a million publications, but um, they kind of, you know, I'm able to tell a story about how they support um, who I am as a scientist and as a researcher. And so you know, I have a cluster of publications about child adolescent anxiety, which is kind of my broad research focus. I have um, some publications, which um, I'm still working on publishing, um, that focus on using electrophysiological research methods. Um, and then also some publications that focus on more um, advanced statistical techniques. Um, something in my postdoc I'm trying to pursue is learning more about computational modeling. So you know, that's kind of how I think I, I try to think of it is like, how do these papers tell a story about who I am and where I want to go um, in my research career and in the skills that I'm trying to develop, um, especially as a postdoc, which is often very focused on, you know, developing skills that you weren't able to, or you only started to develop in during your PhD. Um, I think the only other thing I'd say about publications is that, um, you know, I'm a, a big emphasis of my current training is towards putting in um, a K award application. And so one thing, you know, I'm still finishing up papers from my PhD, but they do like to see evidence that you've published with your current postdoctoral mentors as well. Um, and, you know, as everyone knows, publications take like, or they take a long time for me, <laughs> they definitely take longer than I anticipated. So just kind of factoring that in that, you know, there's projects that I started day one of my postdoc and they're still not ready for publication yet. So, you know, it can take a while, um, but there is still sort of an expectation that you'll have publications with your um, postdoctoral mentors, especially if you're applying for certain grants or certain types of funding. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you, since we've all kind of been talking about skills, I want to ask you each if you could tell me in getting your postdoc, and Joy, in your case, both in getting your postdocs and also in hiring postdocs, and thinking ahead. So what you did in the past and what you want to do in the future. Can you each identify one skill or two skills that have, were instrumental in helping you to be to get and be successful in your postdoc? And maybe another skill that, or two skills that are instrumental in helping you move to the next phase of your career. 
And these could be technical in nature, but I'm thinking more um, maybe even on the soft skills side or the project management side. But I'd like to have the audience know what they should be thinking about to hone right now if they're going towards the postdoc and what they should hone while they're in the postdoc to go to the next point in their career. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I, I think for early on, a lot of it is technical skill development. Um, so in my postdoc, I learned how to do fMRI work. Um, and But doing fMRI involves a lot of programming in whatever language it is that that platform you're using happens to demand. Um, and so, you know, I, I had done some programming as a graduate student, but um, not so much in MATLAB and I was using SPM because I was at UCL. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of technical skill development um, that goes along with the sort of theoretical skill development in sort of using any particular method, I think. And so knowing your method inside out um, in sort of the, the low level, you know, the really low level details as well as the high levels um, problems and strengths and weaknesses of the method is really important. Um, that will sort of carry through in the long run in when you start to develop your own you know research program um, but i do think that things i didn't expect like when i became faculty there was a lot of these soft managerial skills that are like you know teaching skills that i just um uh had had never thought about um, <laughs> before i got this job and took a long time actually to sort of wrap my head around um i don't know that you know, I think there's always a debate about how much to prepare for those kinds of um, skills because it does take away from developing your sort of scientific skills, I think. Um, um, so I, I don't know that I would recommend, for example, teaching or, you know, doing a lot of management, but certainly mentoring undergraduates and graduate students is a good thing to do all, all around. Um, it develops you as a person, it develops these sort of soft skills, and it also helps somebody else. Um, but, but yeah, I don't know, I would, I would put that off for as long as possible and then just deal with it when you have to. <laughs> good, good idea, good advice. Amy, what are your thoughts? Sure, um, I would say, you know, something that um, was important to me um, in kind of pursuing, pursuing my path um, was as a, a graduate student, kind of having this experience of writing a grant revising it heavily um, upon getting feedback and then actually executing the the project and carrying that out um because what it something that i've kind of noticed in moving forward with other grant applications um or fellowship applications is often reviewers they want to see evidence that you can actually kind of execute um your independent research and that um, you know, the research you're proposing is feasible and you can, um, you know, demonstrate that you have those skills to actually see a project through from start to finish. And so I think that has been um, very, very useful for me. And, you know, I think um, even just writing the grant, I've written so many things that have been rejected, but in doing that, you do develop skills and to even if it doesn't get funded, um, just getting that grant writing experience or even just carrying out small projects or overseeing like a senior thesis of a, of a someone, a undergraduate student you're mentoring, you know, those are all kind of things that are, are helpful in that regard. So I think anything that kind of demonstrates research independence and your ability to um, conceptualize unique ideas, um, creative collaborative ideas, but also see them through um, those are the skills that I think have served me the most. Thank you, Amy. Kate, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think the, the things that I got from my PhD that sort of set me up for getting a first postdoc was um, proficiency in the particular method of designing visual behavioral, you know, behavioral experiments to study vision. Uh, I was very interested in psychophysics methodology and um, you know, sort of within that specific method felt quite competent and confident. Um, and then also scientific writing, because I'd been through the process of writing papers and presentations um, multiple times. So I think I had a kind of base level of scientific competency or literacy in the papers and in the process of um, uh, experimental design and analysis within this one method. Um, I was quite apprehensive uh, going, trying to get a postdoc in the first lab I did in Cambridge because their methods were uh, like deep learning and fMRI, neither of which I had any experience in. I could 
program to some degree, um, but I didn't know anything about machine learning, had never analyzed fMRI data. Uh, but to my pleasant surprise, it seemed like the, um, the PI's attitude was that I uh, knew a lot about behavioral design, which was a large component also of what they did. You know, they needed to design behavioral experiments to do in the scanner. Uh, and that I had a lot of passion for the particular topic, that I was very eager to learn the kind of skills that the, the lab used. Uh, and so they kind of had the patience with me to let me develop new technical skills there, um, which I was very sort of pleasantly surprised by. Uh, and then I've kind of used my postdocs to acquire technical skills. Like I wanted to learn um, much higher level programming skills and machine learning and computational modeling, um, which I have done in both of the postdocs. Uh, and then this one also, I wanted to learn like 3D rendering of stimuli and game engines, this kind of stuff, uh, which my current postdoc supervisor has also had the patience to let me learn. Um, so I've kind of used postdocs to learn specific technical skills, but in order to get the first postdoc, my PhD had set me up well with the kind of basis of scientific writing and experimental design. Thank you. And Kate, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up this idea of not necessarily knowing 100% about the lab or the group that you're going to go work for. You're, it's important for the graduate students, for the students who are here today to know, and also the people that are in a postdoc and thinking about doing a second one, when you go to do a postdoc, when you go to the next milestone in your career, you're not expected to know everything there. That's why you're going there. So don't be afraid to reach out and say, I want to learn. I'd like to contribute and I would like to learn from you. We are almost at, out of time. So I would like to ask if each of our panelists can give literally a one minute piece of advice. What is the most important thing you want to share with the audience about the path to the postdoc. What do they need to know to land the postdoc? What do they know to 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 do? What do they need to know to leverage the postdoc? And uh, Joy, why don't we start with you? You got one minute, please. Okay. Um, I guess you know, despite the uncertainty of the postdoc years, which I think is psychologically really hard, um, try to remember that the postdoc years are actually really glorious. I mean, they're a really good time to learn new things, to think about things deeply, to not be distracted by all these other sort of demands on your time. Um, and so really take advantage of the time in graduate school as well as in your postdoc years to build your toolkit personally and technically and and scientifically to to do the kind of work that you want to do. Um, and, and think of it as an opportunity where you are going to learn new things and you can explore the things that you uh, want to want to explore. Absolutely. Thank you, Joy. And I think you'd also agree, enjoy, pursue joy in your postdoc. <laughs> like, have a good time. This is your time to explore different areas of science and to use these skills in new ways. So thank you for that. Amy, what are your thoughts? What's your one minute piece of advice? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of landing the postdoc, um, just tending to your network, um, keeping in touch with people, um, you know, just following up and um, you you know, just kind of learning about the research that people are doing. And, um, you know, I think for me, at least, it was helpful to kind of be a known entity when I came back to Columbia. Um, you know, they knew the people I had worked with, and that kind of, I think, gave me a little bit of credibility, a little bit of a foot in the door. Um, and in terms of kind of maximizing your postdoc, you know, something that I've really appreciated in my current position is being able to um, build collaborations and have a mentor who. Um, really fosters and encourages those collaborations as I kind of pursue a range of different skills. So, um, you know, I came into my postdoc, wanted to learn some new things, and, um, you know, was obviously kind of an intimidating thing to take on, but my, having a mentor who was very supportive and also helped to um, connect me with a number of different faculty members has been um, a really positive experience. We can't overstate the importance of championing yourself in the community so people know what value you will provide and can provide and of collaborating with mentors who are there for you, who have your back and want to see you succeed no matter what you do. Kate, what is your final statement, please? Uh, yeah, I'd reiterate what uh, Amy said about the importance of talking to people, connecting to people, uh, not just when you want uh, jobs. It's uh, always totally fine to cold email people, even just to say, uh, you know, I love your work. Would you be up for a short chat? Would you like to talk at my online journal club? Could I give a talk at your online journal club? 
Um, there's lots of really fun things that have popped up, like virtual coffee hours with people in specific fields. I think there are there are some um, kind of even easier, more kind of egalitarian to access possibilities for networking with people all around the world at the moment. So if you like someone's research, go talk to them and figure out, uh, you know, whether you can collaborate, whether at some point in the future they might have jobs for you. Absolutely. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Joy. Thank you to this amazing panel. You were awesome. I want to thank the audience today. We really appreciated your kind attention and we hope that you found uh, um, both joy and help in what we talked about, as well as Amy and Kate. <laughs> uh, this webinar, as you know, was being record is recorded. You will be able to access this later. And the team has already said that if you'd like to reach out to them, of course, uh, several of our members are on Twitter. So you can find us on Twitter. And if we can help you in the future, please let me know. Please let, please let all of them know. So thank you. Round of applause for our amazing team today. You guys were awesome, and thank you, APS. Pleasure working with you, as always. Here's to your unicorn career. Go for it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.